and describe a joyful moment. And most of them, I mean, some of them I alluded to earlier in terms of conceptual understandings or whatever, but basically when you see the end result in a local community, so whether it has to do with improved child nutrition or a community foundation, which we were very involved in helping start and grow community foundations pretty much all over the world, and then you go visit one of the foundations and you go visit one of its programs and you see the difference it's making whether to women or children or, you know, micro borrowers, it's, that's, that's joy, seeing that, in fact, what one is doing is making a difference. Wonderful. That's joy. Seeing what we're doing is making a difference, right? That was really incredible. And you notice she talked about societal impact, about really trying to solve a problem. Most philanthropists today are really looking at, you know, they're not looking for just the Band-Aid solution. They're kind of tired of Band-Aid solutions. They really want us to solve big problems. Did, were you struck by how knowledgeable she was about what the organization was doing? Very, very knowledgeable. Let's look at some of, the, some of the lessons from the US and see if these are some of the ones you picked up. So again, somebody is talking about strategic philanthropy, being strategic, being planful and focused. She looked for a sound organization. We heard that earlier. We heard that from, um, from uh, Dame Shirley, said, I looked for a responsible NGO, right? A sound organization with shared values. She talked about building trust and inclusiveness. She talked about impact, impact, impact. And of course, once again, we heard about joy. We heard about how good it feels to be a part of a solution, to be a part of, a part of that. Like the UK, in the US, women, according to research, drive philanthropy. 92% um, of donor men, men who are donors, say that their spouse is the biggest single influence in their giving. 81% say they defer to their spouse on which NGO to give to, and 84% say that they defer to their spouse on how much they give. So women clearly, now when they, in the same study, when they asked women what had the biggest impact on their giving, we, it takes a village for us. So we had like 15 different factors. You know, oh, I talked to my friends, I talked to my boss, I talked to, you know, we, we need a whole village. Guys were clear, I just talked to my spouse, I move on. <laughs> yeah? So now we're gonna take a vote, we're gonna have a little vote. This was a study that came out about the motivation of women. I want you to listen to each one, and then I want you to tell me if you think it does also apply to men, right? Which, so we're gonna, come, we're gonna come at the end, are any of these things that are unique to women, or do we think that they apply to men? So you ready? So if you think it applies to men, you're going to be a big shout out, you're gonna clap, you can stand up, whatever you wanna do. You know, you wanna get a little exercise in, whatever you wanna do. All right, so here's the first one. Women want to create new solutions, the research said. Is that true for men too? All right. Women want to change things for the better. In fact, 98% of women report achieving social change as their highest priority. Do you think that that's true for men too? Yeah? How about this one? They want to commit through volunteerism. They want to be a part of actually actively volunteering. Is that true for men too? Not so much. Some of you think, some of you are married to active or hanging out with active men, some of you active men in the room. They want to connect with the human face attached to the gift. Is that a female mostly? Is that men and women? What do you think, men? Yeah? And finally, they want to collaborate. They like that there is a shared vision for the future and that they're collaborating. Do you think men are collaborators? Yeah, yeah? They, I don't know. You guys are not even like applauding for yourselves on this one, yeah? All right, so let's keep listening and see if, again, if we change any minds at the end when we talk. So, oh, they wanted to celebrate and have fun. Sorry, I missed that one. Let's go back to that one. Yeah, guys like to have fun, right? Yes, okay. So our next guest, and um, I met several people in my master class from Brazil, so 
uh, you can shout out and help me if I totally screw this up. Um, this is Viviane Senna, is that all right? Uh, and she leads an organization called the Instituto Ariton, Ariton, Ariton Senna, after her brother, the famous Formula, Formula One champion who died 15 years ago. She became a prominent voice for philanthropy at that time, and she's going to tell us a little bit about uh, why and what she's doing. So our first question to her was, how did your philanthropy begin? O Instituto Ayrton Senna nasceu de um grande desejo, tanto meu quanto do meu irmão Ayrton Senna, que era um piloto de Fórmula 1, foi tricampeão mundial de Fórmula 1 é, e teve um acidente no qual ele morreu, mas ele deixou esse sonho com, conosco, com a família, de dar para crianças brasileiras a mesma oportunidade que ele teve, que eu tive, de ter educação, de ter futuro, e desse sonho, então, nasceu o Instituto Ayrton Senna. And then we asked her, tell us more about the organization, tell us a little bit more about what it does. É, hoje, esse sonho já é uma realidade, em mais de 2 milhões de crianças por ano que passam a ter essas oportunidades de se desenvolver, em 1.300 e tantos municípios brasileiros, que significam um quinto dos municípios do país, em todos os estados brasileiros. E como é que a gente dá essas oportunidades? A gente dá através de educação. Porque de todas as oportunidades mais importantes que alguém pode ter na vida, a de educação é a, é a mais significativa, a mais estratégica para que a pessoa possa desenvolver os seus potenciais e poder chegar a trazer a, a luz tudo aquilo que ela trouxe. And we asked, what impact do you feel you have made? Foi talvez o grande diferencial e a grande contribuição que o Instituto trouxe nesses últimos 15 anos ao país. Trazer essa lógica de larga escala para dentro do trabalho do terceiro setor e para dentro do setor público, que já trabalha com larga escala, mas sem o aspecto, o componente da qualidade. O que a gente agregou foi justamente colocar na mesma equação o aspecto quantitativo de larga escala e o aspecto qualitativo para que ambos juntos possam realmente dar para as pessoas aquilo que elas precisam para ser o potencial que elas trouxeram ao nascer. Esse é o meu grande sonho. Tenho certeza que se o Ayrton estivesse aqui, é, seria também o dele. All right, so let's think about what lessons that we learned from Brazil. So I thought I heard, again, strategic philanthropy, right? Someone else who's decided to be focused and strategic. And she talked about passion, and she talked about the importance of unlocking potential. Yeah, all of those things, very, very important. Our final uh, speaker today, our final guest today, is Ya Namaku. Uh, she's a part-time teacher uh, in Ghana. And as a child, she said that she learned to give through her Sunday school. Uh, she is highly educated. She graduated from the University of Ghana. She went on to the US to get a graduate degree from George Mason University. And uh, she believes that her giving and her work with the African Women's Development Fund is part of her, her faith, part of her belief. So let us listen to her. The first question we asked was, what inspires you in your philanthropy? And when did you start giving? I'm inspired by the fact that uh, a lot of people in Africa live below the poverty line. Um, majority of these Africans are women and um, this touches my heart a lot. Um, I have also realized that um, these women um, have lack of access to a lot of resources uh, such as land, um, capital, technology, food and water. And this is something that touches me, and I've decided to give. 
I started giving a long time ago. Um, I have been giving to children um, who need clothing and um, toys, books, because I feel that um, the need to be happy. So um, this has been going on for a while now. I also give out my time and energy in terms of teaching, and learning on how to read and to write. Then we asked her, have you visited any projects? And what did you learn from your visits? I visited um, WAG in Ghana, uh, where there's an HIV shelter for women. And when I got there, I felt that, yes, there was a need to give because they needed funds for medication and other support. I talked to a lot of the women, interacted with them, and uh, had their stories, which were very, very moving. So um, this inspired me to give. And what results are you looking for when you give? And what do you expect from the organizations you support? Of course, I expect that they will be used wisely. Um, I expect that um, AWDF, and I know that they are touching women's lives. Um, they have six thematic areas, um, human, women's human rights, they have political participation, um, empowering women, they have HIV AIDS, they have health and reproductive rights, and uh, I expect that these funds will be used to help women in these areas. Well, I expect that the funds I give to these organizations will go a long way to alleviate poverty. I expect um, newsletters from them. I expect feedback to know what's going on, updates, and a, a whole lot. Yeah. And finally, we asked, tell us a story of joy. The most joyful gifts are my time, actually, and my energy, um, my skills in, in teaching. Um, because I believe that reading, especially in writing, is important for every woman. Every woman needs to be educated.